Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC card for this weekend. Um, this is going to be the first of, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get all three videos out because I'm going to be in Virginia this weekend. But at the very least, I'll be able to take care of this one, which is the you know overall DFS outlook. Again, in a perfect world, I would also do a full uh, lineup construction video, um, but I would be remiss to do that now because lines are not up yet. The Sims are not done yet, really. And ownerships are not completely the way I'd like to see them. To build lineups now would be would be just foolish. Um, but then again, I mean, if you've watched the other the other videos on how I build lineups, I mean, you could go back to them uh, and, and probably apply them to this card as well. But uh, I very much doubt I'm going to be able to find time to do a full lineup construction video for this particular card. Um, I'm going to attempt to do a betting breakdown video uh, either later today or tomorrow. So at the very least, we will have a, a general DFS outlook as well as a betting breakdown. All right, so let's get started. And the first thing I want to handle is this first fight that you'll see on the bottom, which was originally Victor Hugo against Haile Alatang. And uh, Alatang was, uh, had to withdraw. So they had to either replace him or not. And they did find a replacement. Now, when that happens, you always run the risk of having a fighter that is, you know, uh, either way less likely to win than the original opponent or way more likely to win. And what that will do is really throw the DFS uh, lineups into disarray because they can't change the salary of Victor Hugo. I mean, they priced him as if he were about a minus 120 favorite or something like that, minus 110. And so if they rebooked him against some you know terrible fighter, you would have a possibility of him being extreme chalk. Um, as he's been priced as a small favorite. Um, and if he turns out he was like minus 500, then we'd have this unique situation where he'd be incredible chalk and you have to decide what to do with him. As it stands right now, the uh, fighter they replaced him with, Pedro Falco, I guess that's the way you pronounce him, is actually not bad, uh, apparently. As the initial line, at least coming out on Bet Online, has Victor Hugo at about a minus 150. So you do have some line value here um, because, you know, he's minus 150, which means he probably should be about 8,400 or so, but it's not that bad. Okay. So when I say that, you're not going to, I don't think, at Hugo with an extreme, you know, 60% ownership number, unless this original bet online number is just so far off that it steams and Turns out Victor Hugo would be like a minus 300 favorite. So that is something that you're going to have to take, uh, you know, keep an eye on. Um, in addition to that, we don't exactly have the inside the distance prop yet on this, but I would like to think it's going to be very similar to what it was because Victor Hugo is kind of a submission guy. You know, he, he does get like a whole bunch of submissions. So he is kind of a finisher. So I would imagine that, regardless it's probably going to be a good play okay 8200 maybe minus 150 or so any sort of a finisher i do think that he is going to be in play the interesting part of this is going to be the other side i think um pedro whatever his name is and you know we're we're, we're kind of just kind of looking here at what is what he does you know uh, we have he hasn't fought here since 2021. Kind of a veteran. He third round KO. And then he has decision in a just looks like a pretty low level promotion. Then he's got a KO in the same promotion though. 2019 KO round one, KO round one. He got hurt here. So it's just kind of hard to say. You know, he could get unanimous decision all the way back here. So I would just guess that he's sort of a finisher, but not really. You know, I, I am inclined to believe that he's probably not a very good player. Um, but I, 
I, I, I encourage you to continue to track the, the inside the distance lines and give you something to look at. You know, if in fact his inside the distance line works out to be something like plus 200 or something like that, then I think that you can probably play him because I still think you will get some ownership on Silva because there is some line value and he does have finishing upside. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's my analysis of this fight. Uh, you you always have a you know uh, some ownership in this in this mid range and probably for good reason. So let's let's put Hugo in here just to kind of get started. So now you have Melissa Dixon. Now uh, Melissa Mullins. I guess she got married uh, against Noah Cornell or Cornole. Now we last saw Noah Noah Cornole in uh, the France card when she fought Jocelyn Edwards, and it was a uh, it was a pretty, it was a pretty uh, boring fight. Um, some would have argued that Edwards won. Um, you know, it, it was a close fight. That's my opinion, but whatever. She's not particularly, you know, exciting. It's not doesn't seem to have quite a bit of finishing upside. If you would like her, it would just because you think that a sixty nine hundred dollar fighter in and of itself is good enough to make the optimal if she wins. Um, so we do have 14 fights. So usually when you have 14 fights, just getting a win is just not going to be good enough. So I don't think her at 6,900 is going to be particularly inspiring. Uh, the interesting part is the Melissa Mullins. So she's, she's very, very, she's priced really high. Okay. Um, and at 9,300, normally what you need is at least minus 110 inside the distance line, plus some takedown upside and or first round upside. And as you might imagine, I mean, Melissa Dixon's probably not going to fit the bill as far as those metrics go. You look at this, her inside the distance line is plus 225, which is extremely poor. But um, it's possible that she swarms with takedowns and control time. I mean, it's possible. Um, but the problem is, I mean, you're dealing with a parlay. Here. The parlay here is that you have to hope she, A, goes for the takedowns, and then, B, they're successful enough to score well. You know, uh, she does have this first-round TKO over Dario, which was pretty, pretty, pretty fun fight, actually, if you look at it. A um, couple of decisions, does have a KO here. So I guess she does have finishing upside. And one thing I will say is that she's probably going to be extremely low owned. You have this a $9,300 women's fighter with, with a poor inside the distance line. She probably is going to be low owned. So in your MME builds where you're trying to win the big prize, I do think that she's probably pretty good leverage, but I think most of the time she, she wins with like an 80, you know, or an 85 and, and bus, but, but those times that she doesn't, you know, when she does go for the takedowns and, and, and gets control time and, and gets, you know, that optimal, what, second round, late second round finish with a lot of, you know, ground and pound or whatever, I mean, she could get 120. And then then you, you'll you want her, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and if you get her at, you know, 12% ownership, 13% ownership, when you have other fighters in her price range, which are going to be much more popular, uh, I definitely think that is a decent amount of leverage, knowing, again, going in, that most likely it's not going to work. But but when it does work, you're going to be, you know, you're going to get a lot of leverage. Um, so I would certainly consider that. All right, Dylan Butka versus Cesar Almeida. Meda. So there are several fights on this card, and we're going to get to, you know, I think, like at least six, five, where, where you have win condition plays, meaning that, you can't guarantee a fighter is going to win, but if in fact they do win, it's going to be in a way that scores them a good amount of points. And sometimes that situation occurs when you have strikers versus grapplers. And this is the case. So Cesar Almeida is basically a pure kickboxer. And Dylan Butka has a definitely a takedown upside. So, so the point is, is that, you know, when you have these types of, 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 of fights, you only want to play the striker if he really has a good inside the distance line. And you almost always want to play the grappler regardless. Okay. Because the grappler, his win condition is going to follow, you know, it's going to get some points regardless of whether he gets the finish. 
So let's take a look at, at both of these. So as I mentioned, Budka is going to be a good play regardless. Um, and just for fun, we'll look at his inside the distance line. It's actually not that bad at plus 240. But when you combine that with his win condition, that being the ability to get these takedowns um, and rack up points in that way, I think he's a very strong play. And Almeida, unfortunately, is inside the distance line is extremely poor. So uh, I think he's going to be a fade. And there there are going to be, I think, several fighters on this card, which I will consider Xing out. Like one of them being Corn Cornoli, for example. Uh, another one being Cesar Almeida, like I mentioned. We'll get to some others as we get there. And this is not something I usually do or recommend. I usually let the Sims kind of guide me to, to who I get. But I think that I'm, I'm so confident in... in in fading some of these situations, some of these fighters that I, I might just actually go against my better judgment and flat out X them. And Almeida would be, um, would be somebody I might X at and Cornoli, as, as, as I mentioned. But so we have Jean Mat, uh, Matsumoto and this was a curious situation. So this is the second of three in, in three fights. We're talking about a, a, a fighter who participated in this French, in this France card. And Matsumoto is kind of a combination of, of he's Brazilian, but he was also from France or whatever. And it doesn't, oh no, it wasn't him. Sorry about that. The guy, oh no, we're going to get to him in a minute. The guy, the guy that was in the France card is, um, where is he? Oh, Sharia. We're going to get to him in a minute. But this is uh, John Matsumoto versus uh, Daniel Argetta. So again, you have Daniel Argetta, who is a, a stone cold wrestler. Okay. And, and when you have this situation, okay, when you have striker versus grappler, you almost always want to take the grappler in DFS. Um, not because you think he's going to win, but because if, in fact, he wins, you're pretty sure that he's going to score. Where if you take the striker, the striker can win without scoring. I guess that's the easiest way to put this. So let's take a look at the inside the distance line specifically for, for Matsumoto and see if it's worth doing. I mean, his inside the distance line, let's see, is plus 315, which is which is terrible, right? So he's going to be probably a fade, and I would almost X him out. And Argetta, again, even though his inside the distance line is plus 450, I don't really care all that much. Now, first of all, he did, I mean, sort of get a finish a couple of fights ago against uh, Ronnie Lawrence. Um, he was basically finishing him, but they called a premature stoppage. I mean, he was just destroying it, if you want to know the truth. So when you look at this inside, you look at this game log, you don't really notice this, but, um, you know, he was he was after it. I mean, this was a really, really good performance, which is just not showing up here on the, on, on the board because of, you know, the, the official results. But he was getting after it. Um, Aguirre, you know, he did, Aguirre's not very good, but he did have four takedowns over there, but he did have two takedowns against Miles Johns, but then Miles Johns turned the tables, and as we've seen, Miles Johns is better than we all thought he was. Um, so, Argetta, I think, is an extremely strong underdog here. And Matsu, Matsu, Matsumoto, I, I really think, is a fade. I mean, he's, he's a striker without, you know, against a grappler, without a strong inside the distance line. So, at least my opinion. Pierre Rodriguez against Cynthia Calvillo. Um, uh, women's fight with, and I say, don't say that to be sexist. I say that to indicate that there's usually, the metrics are usually not strong enough to, to justify playing them because they usually don't have as much finishing upside as needed to pay off their prices. So you, you're really looking for the rare finish or the extreme grappling upside. And in this particular case, like you see, there's no inside the distance line. I'm actually not even sure who's got the grappling upside. Um, I, I guess Calvillo would be considered the better wrestler, I suppose. Um, I mean, she does have some takedowns, including three against not Amanda Nunez, but Nina Nunez, I believe. Um, but I don't know. She does have. You have a takedown against Gudinias. That wasn't a bad performance. Some people thought she actually won that fight. Um, so I guess that's fine. And Pierre Rodriguez, I mean, she she got so, she she got five takedowns against Sam Hughes. I mean, three against I I, I would argue that 
at, that Pierre Rodriguez, if anybody, would have the more takedown upside. She did take down Jillian Robertson, and then she ended up, you know, tapping. But she was she was didn't feel like tapping, and she was very very tough here. So, yeah, I guess Pierre Rodriguez, if you wanted to be contrarian. This would be kind of cool. You know, this this would actually be a pretty cool low owned play. I believe she's gonna be low owned to play Pierre Rodriguez here. Um, so we're gonna leave her in for now. Uh, Norma Dumont versus uh, versus uh, uh, the Iron Lady G Duran to me. So she was actually you know fighting for titles. I think she might have been actually the title holder for a while. Look at look at this look at this look at this group here. I mean, like she beat Holly Holm. In a five rounder, she beat Raquel Pennington. This is back 2018, but you know, then a one round KO of Aspen Ladd. And she took, I mean, she went for the full five with Amanda Nunez, got in 126 strikes. I mean, well, a lot of them from far off her back, just kind of fighting. And then, I mean, against Juliana Pena, who's one of the top five in the world, I think, at this point. I mean, she, she subbed her in the third round. Um, she wasn't doing all that well up until then, but but I mean, this this girl's dangerous. And, and and listen, she's been away for four years, but it's one of those things. I mean, if she comes back with three and a half years, she comes back even remotely like she was. Now, listen, she had a baby, and there's all kinds of things that happen when that occurs. But seventy six hundred, I mean, it just seems like a good play. We'll, we'll we'll take a look at the inside the distance line for both of these fighters here. Um, Norma Dumont. She ever finished anybody? I mean, she first, she's plus four hundred inside. She doesn't really have the. I don't think she really has the takedown upside here. Can she? Is, can she? I guess she can. I mean, she has three takedowns against Chandler, one against Rosa, two against. So yeah, I mean, she could take her down, but she does. I mean, she's putting herself in a tough spot. You know, Randy is pretty good submission submission grappler, so. Listen, uh, just because of the price, I think I prefer the the random the randomy side. Uh, let, let you know. Let's compare Dumont to say Rodriguez. I think that's a pr pretty good comparison here because they're the same price, and they feel like like kind of fishy plays, and they're probably going to be low owned as a result. So I I would put her in the category, I guess, of Rodriguez. Maybe I was about to say a little worse play, but I guess similar. I mean, you'd probably get Dumont at really low ownership. And if you get the other Duran to me, like, you know, she, she was off for four years, she had a baby, and she's, let's just say that she has to, and I don't know the details, but let's just say that she was just had to finish out her contract somehow. Let's say there was a five year contract and whatever, and she, just to come back to fight one fight or whatever, and she, or she's just her body's not in shape anymore. I mean, Dumont is the active fighter. Dumont is, you know, you could get a Dumont, like multiple takedowns and Duran to me is, whoa, what did I come back here for? Performance. And again, at low ownership, I guess Dumont is certainly viable in 150s, but I would I would not play her in, in, in 20 max stuff. Let's put it that way. And, and just to be clear, I don't think I would get to Rodriguez in 20 max either. Um, but in 150s, I think, you know, Rodriguez, Duran to me, and Dumont, are all in. Let's uh, we'll leave them in here for now. All right, uh, Court McGee versus Alex Morono. So we have ninety two hundred versus seven k. So at ninety two hundred versus seven k, again, we're looking for for the favorite a you know an inside the distance line of minus one ten or better, and if you could throw in some you know some takedown upside, that would be great too. But Morono is not really a takedown guy. I mean, he will um uh he he will, can get subs. I mean, he 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 subbed Tim Means when Tim Means went for the takedowns, and Morono got a good guillotine, I think. But generally, he's a striker. So in that situation, you're really looking for that inside the distance line of at least minus one ten. Um, now, if you can get a first round prop, that'd be nice too. But let's take a look. So Morono inside the distance is plus 110. So it's it's a little bit light, okay? I'm not, you know, let's just call it what it is. It's not great. It's not bad, but it's a little light. I really do want the minus 110. And I think we're going to get to some examples of that a little later. 
Um, maybe we'll see. So far, this is the closest thing we've seen. But um, well, what about Court McGee? So he's going to have an inside the distance line of plus a million, right? So let's just take a look. I mean, I know it's going to be really light. Maybe what plus a thousand? Yeah, plus nine hundred. But you hear me out here. Um, so he got blitzed in his last two fights, right? He lost in the first one. Right? That, that is what it is. Right? But his two fights before that, he had five takedowns en route and 12 minutes of control time en route to an 111-point smash breaking the slate. Okay. In, in this fight before that, he had three takedowns. He also had a knockdown that fight, too. He had three takedowns at eight minutes of control time and some pitter-patter for good for 90. Okay. Um, he has other fights in his resume for takedowns, for takedowns. So I'll say this, that he's not going to win all that often. You know, he's going to win what? What is this? Plus 270. So big, big free plus 250. So, so you know what, about 25% of the time, maybe 28% of the time. But I'll tell you this, I, I don't see a world that he wins that he doesn't score. You know, how is Court McGee winning without getting this, this type of performance? You know what I mean? Like, if he can't get these takedowns, he's going to get lit up on the feet, right? So I think that Court McGee, I don't think anybody's going to play this. I mean, if you want to know the truth, I mean, the guy's coming off of two straight first round KO losses. Um, but again, you have to have a little bit of vision here. And, and if in fact he does win, forget the fact that he's just going to win at a, at a good price. He's also going to score. So I think that's a, uh, and you, you know, listen, go into it knowing that that seventy percent of the time this is going to lose because he's a three to one or almost three one underdog. But when he does win, you're going to be extremely happy. Um, so I, I consider both of these fighters in play, Morono and McGee. Uh, but again, same thing. Like if Morono wins, he doesn't make optimal all the time. When if when McGee if McGee wins he makes the optimal. I'll put it to you another way, he makes the optimal more often when he wins than Morono does when he wins. I believe. Anyway, uh, all right, let's move on to Charlie Campbell versus Trevor Peak. Um, so I think this is going to end up being probably the most popular, un well, I would imagine, the most popular underdog on the slate um, and certainly the most uh, targeted fight with the, maybe the exception of the main event, but we'll get there in a minute, on the slate. And that would be Charlie Campbell versus Trevor Peake. The inside of the distance line of this fight is, is, just, is just through the roof. I mean, Trevor Peake fights some, you know, very, very aggressive style. And as does Charlie Campbell. I mean, Charlie Campbell, let's 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 take a look at him first. Um, Charlie Campbell, he has. Well, forget this. This is a grappling. We had first round KO against Alex Reyes. He's a million to one favorite. First round KO as a million one favorite. We lost first round KO to Chris Duncan. First round KO, second round KO, second round KO. Could go to a decision here. Lost by a decision in 2019. So he, he comes after it. And then you have the curious case of Trevor Peak. So what, what if I told you, for those of you that have been following Trevor Peak, for example, what if I told you that he has fought three times in the UFC? And two of those three fights went to a decision. You wouldn't, probably wouldn't, I mean, you would know this is the case because you've seen the fights, but you'd be kind of taken aback because 
Trevor Peak. I mean, he's, you know, he's kill or be killed, freaking maniac, you know, whatever. But the, the, the reality is, is that he has fought three times in the UFC. And his last two fights, as a matter of fact, went to a decision. Um, one of This is actually a pretty big hit that we had. We played him by decision over Muhammad Yaya at like plus 500 or something like that. And we got there. Uh, and this Jose Mariscal fight, I mean, this was a war, but nobody got finished. He didn't get finished, nobody got finished. The Gonzalez fight, he, he destroyed him. This Malik Lewis fight, I mean, we, I, you, you go back and you'll see this one. I mean, he was getting lit up in the first round, but then he came back, you know. So let's just say this, that that everybody is, that's, that's drilling this inside the distance line to minus 500 or something, I, I, I might be inclined to go against that again. Um, I might be inclined to play one of these dudes by decision from a betting perspective. But when it comes to DFS, it is very hard to ignore these metrics. It's like, you look at this, you have Charlie Campbell inside the distance. Boy, oh, but I thought this was going to be more. Like, minus 125? I Boy, this is sneaky. You know, I, I really didn't think it was going to be this wide. I thought that you were going to have an inside the distance line. This, this makes sense of minus 400. That's what I thought it was going to be. But then I thought that Campbell would be minus 200 or something. Uh, and then peak plus 215. Uh, that's extremely strong for a 7K fight. It just is. Uh, so I imagine he's going to be really popular. But it's just it just has to be for good reason. Because I mean, if he wins, it's very likely to that, that he gets the KO. As a, in addition to that, by the way, uh, going back to some of his contender series fights, he did he does have some takedowns in his arsenal as well. So if even if Peak somehow wins the decision, I mean he's gonna score well there as well. I mean he's gonna there's gonna be volume, there's gonna be it's gonna be stuff going on in this fight. But even if this does does go to the decision, I think that both fighters are extremely live. Like even if Campbell, you know, wins by decision. He can still get there, but it's hard. It's just hard. He's got you know, like multiple knockdowns, I think. I mean, I guess he could get there on pure volume, but I don't think he's going to get takedowns. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe he will. I mean, Pete got taken down like five times by, by Marischal. Um, So maybe if Campbell has that in his arsenal somehow, uh, that could happen. But nonetheless, I mean, this fight's got a lot of, lot of, lot of routes to the optimal, let's put it that way. And I think it is obviously the key fight and you're probably going to want to get 100%. All right. Um, Walter Walker, the clean monster, uh, versus uh, Luca Lucas Breschke. And this fight is, is kind of a shit show. I mean, you have... You have two heavyweights. I mean, you have Walker, who's like a he's like he's like six he's like a hundred feet tall, four million pounds. You know what I mean? He's just a monster. Okay. And then you have Breski, who's like a little bit lighter, but he looks a lot heavier than he did. I mean, he looks much more jacked than he did. Um, we can attribute that to you know, clean living and 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 and, and, a, and a very sound. Um, workout routine if we want. Um, so let's do that. Nonetheless, there's a lot of variance in these these fighters' physiques. Let's put it that way. The thing is, is that Walker is 9,400. So at 9,400, if you want to play him, he better get either a first-round KO or a whole bunch of takedowns. And Apparently, from what I have heard, it is the latter that is the main path. I mean, apparently, he he likes to, you know, take people down and ground and pound them. Uh, so it doesn't 
let's put it this way. It, it doesn't provide a lot of room for error, you know, at, at 9,400. Uh, and Breschke, he's, he's, you know, he's fought some fights. You know, it's not like he's just awful. Like, listen, he, 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 one could argue that he got robbed against Martin Budai, and he put up a really good fight there, to say the least. Carl Williams, I mean, Carl Williams, as we've seen, I mean, just takes people down. You know, he's just an insane wrestler. And even so, I mean, he came back a little bit there. He's not bad. Then he got a lit up by Acosta for Cortez, which is not great. But 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 who died and left and left, you know, Walter Walker as as the next John Jones. You know what I mean? Like, what what has he done? I mean, he's fought guys that no one's ever heard of. And, and, and I don't know. It, it feel it feels fishy to take uh, to take him. But let's let's let let's look at the odds here. Let's I mean let's look at the inside the distance line. Um, all right, so Walker inside. Yeah, there you go. It's minus one thirty. I mean minus one thirty plus plus takedowns. I mean, I guess you got to I guess you got to play him if you can. So. We'll throw him in. Uh, Breschke. See, the thing about Breschke, what makes him intriguing is that his win odds are not bad. You know, he's plus 200 or so, and he's, he's 6,800. You compare him to some of these other cheapos you have. He's he's more likely to win the Cornoli. Um more is he more likely to win than McGee? Let's see. Um, yeah, more likely to win a little bit than McGee. But, but okay, there's but and there's but of the but. But he doesn't have that sure, you know, path to to scoring well. You know, like Breschke could win like a decision and score like eighty points or something like that. However, as opposed to Court McGee. I do think the Walker is going to be more popular than Morono, or is it? I don't know. I was going to say that Breski get a little better leverage, even though his upside is not as big as McGee. But I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I definitely think that he's in play. So I guess both sides of this one look fun. So I guess this Josh Van thing is not on the board, right? Okay. So you have. Ignacio Bahamondes versus Christian Yagos. Well, if in fact this is on the board, I, I, don't, I don't know why this is here. There's no inside the distance line. There's no nothing. I mean, I, we'll, we'll just see what happens with that. So Bahamondes versus Christian Yagos. So Bahamondes is 9,100. And he actually has the biggest win the most likely win odds on the slate, you know, with the minus 340. Um, so actually, actually, Melissa Dixon is the highest of them all. But as we went over, she doesn't have the, the, the inside the distance line, but she certainly has the takedown upside. Should I say certainly? I mean, we are hoping she has to take that upside when we play her. So Baja Mondays at 9,100. First of all, his inside the distance line is pretty good. Right, you compare him to say Walker, who's a bigger price, just on money line. Baja Mondays is strong. Let's take a look at the inside the distance line. This is better than I thought it was. You know, Baja Mondays minus one fifty inside is extremely strong. This is a, this is a kind of an elite play here, isn't it? I mean, he's got this. He does have the strongest inside the distance line so far at least on the slate right is anybody better than minus 150 it doesn't it certainly doesn't seem that way we didn't see anybody yet um so if that's the case and he's not the most expensive he's 9100 this looks good to me and, and the one fight where People kind of got on him for him. What I got on him against Trey Ogden. And listen, Trey Ogden made that fight boring. You know, Trey Ogden was kind of afraid to come after him. This fight was not even remotely close. I mean, he won this decision. He won this in a, in a, in a, in a, 
in a tuxedo, so to speak. You know, so um, and then he lost to Ludwig Klein, which was was actually kind of curious. I mean, he was a pretty big favorite there. Um, we're willing to let that go, and apparently the odds makers are. It's a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong play here. Then you have Christus Yagos. Um, we've seen him fight like a bunch of times here. I, I hear, I remember this fight in 2021. I mean, he, he, I think I had the other side of this and, and Soriano was doing fine in the first round, but then Yagos came back and get him a big favorite. Sarukian, he has no chance at either of these two guys. Ricky Glenn, he, Destroyed him pretty pretty fast. And Zell Huber, he lost to, but Zell Huber's really good. Is this like is this a terrible play? It certainly feels as though that Bob Mondays has the upside here, but I wonder if 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 Yagos is not the it's not a it's not a decent punt here. Oh, that's that's rough. He, I just don't think he wins all that often. That's the thing. Uh, let's take a look, by the way. At his inside the distance line, it's probably not bad given his win odds. Eh, plus 550. All right. But the only thing I was going to say is if Baja Monday is his inside the distance line is so strong, he's probably going to be pretty popular. So you get another punt here. Um, boy, oh boy. I'll tell you this in, in the 150 match, you better believe I'm going to have some of this just, just because I mean, you're getting leverage over the probably the best play on the board, which is Baja Monday's. Uh, unless, by the way, it's, it's still possible, by the way, the Vicar Hugo works out to be the best play on the board. I'm not convinced this this line is going to stay here, but whatever it is. We'll see. Um, okay, Morgan Charrier versus Jose Mariscal. This is the fight I spoke about earlier where Morgan Charrier, he fought in, in, this fr in the France card in front of his home fans and he knocked out uh, Zucchini, who no one had heard of from Italy, and, and it happened in like two seconds. Um, well, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, I I don't know about this. I I, I don't know about this guy. That's, that's the best I can describe this. It, it feels very fishy. He's got these losses here. I, mean, I, I, I don't know. What I do know is that Jose Mariscal is 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 a tough dude. You know, he he won me a lot of money in that in that fight against uh Trevor Peak that we I referred to earlier, where nobody gave him a chance. He was plus one thirty. He was the ultra sharp side because every nobody picked him, and yet he was only plus one thirty. And he dominated, honestly. Um and then Jack Jenkins fight, I have to say it was kind of close. Like Jenkins did win the first round. And um and Mariscal was coming back a little bit in the second round and was fortunate enough that, that Jenkins got injured and had to, you know, they had to call the fight. Um, this is more of an opinion than anything else. I I, I do think that Mariscal is definitely a play here, but um, let's, let's, let's see what the, let's see what the, uh, the inside the distance lines are, because this is where it gets a little confusing to me. Um, when I first considered doing this video, I was imagining that, you know, this is going to be another fight that's going to be really, really hard to ignore. But you look at the inside the distance lines here. Actually, look at this. So you have Charrier plus 200. I don't understand this at all. Like Mariscal inside plus 585. All, all, all I will say is this. If, if, if in fact, and I'm, I'm going to be playing this fight. There's no way I'm not playing Mariscal inside the distance at some point. There's just no no chance. I'm definitely doing this. Um, but I'll say this is that if in fact these and this that's where you can, you know, employ your take if you want. Like if these inside the distance lines stay the way they are, then then you're telling me that Mariscal's not he's not gonna be popular. Yes, can't be. With a with a plus one whatever, plus five hundred inside. When you have his opponent, Morgan Charrier, plus I don't know. Not bad. Plus 200, right? I mean, he's... What's he compared to... Um, 
well, there was no good 8,200. I mean, he's probably as good of a play, at least on the matches, he looks like it's Hugo, but I, I don't I don't get this. So anyway, if you go by the metrics, you, you, you don't want to play Mariscal and, and Charrier is whatever, but I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a take on here, and I think Mariscal's an incredibly strong play here. No nobody said that Morgan Charrier has to be any good at all, just based on that one performance against the the, the other guy that we never heard of. Mariscal's been fighting like real play, real fighters. I don't know. That's that, that's gonna be my take. All right, uh Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson, minus 200 versus plus 170-ish. We'll look at the inside the distance line, 87 versus 75. All right. I think there's a little tiny tinge of line value in Hernandez, actually. You know, at those prices, uh, I, I think that's the case. But let's take a look at the inside the distance lines here. We have, let's see. Boy, this Mariscal thing really has me confused. Anyway, um, Alexander Hernandez, uh, boy, there it is, minus one ten inside at eighty seven hundred. Let's go. I mean, that's 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 what you want. And yet, what I was going to say is that Damon Jackson is one of those fighters that has a good win condition. You know, he he if he's going to win this fight. He's probably going to do so by getting these takedowns. I don't know why he didn't go for any takedowns against Dan Ige, but this is what happens when you don't. Um, Sabatini, he just he just blitzed him. I, I don't even know where that came from, which is good because I don't know if he was going to get any takedowns on Sabatini anyway. But check this out. He got two takedowns in reversal against the aforementioned Dan Argetta. In 10 minutes of control time? I mean... I don't know if he's going to win, but if he does, I mean, he's definitely scoring. So <coughs> this is extremely strong. I mean, when you have these types of underdogs, like Damon Jackson and Daniel Argetta, like guys that have like that path to victory, that's pretty undeniable. I mean, this is, these are two extremely strong underdogs. I mean, it's, it's the point where I almost don't even want to bother with those punts that I talked about. I mean, McGee, yes, but he, he doesn't win all that often. Peak, though. I mean, look look at these. These three underdogs right here are pretty insane. You know, we don't have to go to Yagos if we don't feel like it. We don't have to go to Brescu if we don't feel like it. I mean, look, look at, I mean, listen, you don't even have to do this because that's 10K a man, whatever. But the, these four underdogs are just kind of the nuts. As a matter of fact, I mean, you want to make a rule that you have to have at least one of these in every lineup, maybe even two? Certainly one. I mean, like, it just doesn't get too much better than this if you want to know the truth. Anyway. Um, Brendan Allen versus Chris Curtis. I am inclined to full fade this one um and, and i'm gonna give you my this is a, this is what, I, I can't do the, the the accent but as uh as uh don corleone said at the, at the godfather i must say no to you and i will give you my reasons um i must fade this fight and i will give you my reasons i mean chris curtis i mean for for better or worse Chris Curtis is really where fantasy points go to die nowadays. Now, it didn't used to be that way. You know, like, like, and you look back, I mean, like, for, first of all, he, he, he knocked out Phil Hawes in the first round. He knocked out the aforementioned Brandon Allen in the, in the second round. Basically owned him on the feed. And he got the K over, over Joaquin Buckley. But but aside from that, I mean, you're getting like some boring fights. Um, Barrio, who just is known, I was at this one. This Barrio, who's just known for just coming after you and just putting a pace on whatever. This fight just ended up being just like trading, 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 and and, and Curtis Williams to the split, eighty-seven points. 
at 8,500, that's fine, but it's not that great. Imavov, that wasn't really going anywhere. The Gastelum fight was as boring as all hell. And then you had his fight against Hermanson. He did nothing. He just did absolutely nothing. Um, let me just see something real quick. I just, I just want to poke, poke my head into one thing for a second. Um, Brandon Allen, on the other hand, I mean, his fights. I'd like to say they score, but 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 his fights just he's he's a kind of a first of all, it's four straight subs, four straight subs, and six straight wins since the loss to Chris Curtis. And we have a style issue here. The, the, the style issue is that Brandon Allen, while he's not bad on the feet, his his advantage in this matchup is going to be in the grapple, okay? And one thing about Brandon Allen is he is a very, very, I'm going to say smart fighter. He, he's a, he, 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 when he talks about his plans, I mean, he knows these opponents. I remember when he was prepping for his fight against Ian Brent's Bruno Silva. He's like, well, I'm not going to go stand and train with the guy. I don't want to get my head taken. You know what I mean? Like, he 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 does plan for these things. And this fight against Muniz was, like, amazing. You know what I mean? He basically owned him, like, the whole fight. And he got the submission over to Muniz, who's, like, who's like the nuts, as far as what well, he's supposed to have been the nuts. Then the Paul Craig fight, you know, he minded his P's and Q's. He knew that he couldn't really, you know, risk getting tangled. He he kept his neck away, and, and he had nine minutes of control time. And yet still, it was only 86 points. But So he's not the guy. He's going to do what it takes to win. And the problem is, is that Chris Curtis just doesn't get taken down. It's just tough. So I think that what's going to end up happening, if I have to really put it, put it you know, not, to put too fine, not to put too fine a point on it, but I think that it's going to be a boring fight. I think Allen's going to tr maybe try to stay in range try to get takedowns, probably fail, maybe get there, whatever. But I know he just not, doesn't want to trade with, with Curtis because last time he did that, he got knocked down. He's not an idiot. So I think Brandon Allen is, if he wins this fight, it could end up being like a pretty low scoring, you know? And if Chris Curtis wins this fight, he could get a third, fourth round KO, I guess. But even that scores 80, maybe, you know? So I'm inclined to either fade this or, if anything, I guess, I guess Brandon Allen, you know what I mean? Because if, in fact, Brandon Allen does get, like, takedowns or whatever, it could be, like, kind of a long day uh, for Curtis. Um, and you could get a big score. But in general, I'm sort of inclined to fade this for better or for worse. But let's take a look. I mean, we'll take a look at the inside of distance line. I know what it's going to say. It's going to be Brandon Allen minus 110 or something, maybe a little worse. And Chris Curtis plus 260. No, plus 360. Let's take a look. I'm just guessing. Brandon Allen inside minus, it is minus 105 because he's got five rounds to make that happen. So I guess it justifies that. That's why Allen's going to be really popular as well. I don't know. I got 13 other fights. He's really going to outscore the Campbell fight for real. You know, I don't know. Curtis plus 285, not great. Well, not terrible, but not great. Remember, it's not going to come with takedowns. And it could be third, fourth round, something like that also. So I don't know. That's uh, Curtis knocks him out for a second round. I'm going to lose, I believe. I still might go back and play more Brandon Allen just because I do think he's got the upside. Is is he a, like he's got the, he's the same price as Alexander Hernandez? Um, and yeah, I guess Brandon Allen's got more of a ceiling just because he's got five rounds to rack up stuff, but he's going to be higher owned as well. So I don't know. Inclination is to full fade, but if anything, I'll play Brandon. And that actually did go longer than I thought it was going to. But uh, I think we hit hit the uh, – I guess we hit on the main points and the good underdogs and all that stuff. Watch the Victor Hugo line for sure. And uh, 
pretty much all I have for you guys. Good luck, everybody.